you guys. Don't get any ideas, Autumn. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, praise God. Well, if you want to get a head start, you can open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 26. Not quite ready to go there yet, but why not give you a head start, right? Well, today, the Lord has put a message on my heart, and it's one of those messages we call a one-off in the business, because it's not, it's not a part of a series, it's just a word that uh, I believe is for today, and I tell you what, if I wasn't certain of that before we started, I'm absolutely certain of it at this moment right now. It's so amazing to just see the goodness of God and how um, he begins to just connect all the dots, you know, after the fact. You're going on with your plans, you, you hope you're being led by the Spirit, and then all of a sudden all these things happen, and you're like, wow, I'm just a small part of what Holy Spirit is doing in the house today, and that is just really exciting to be a part of. I, I often use this illustration that, man, being used by God is a lot like surfing, um, you, you don't take credit for the wave. <laughs> you, don't, you don't take credit for the ride. All you can do is put yourself into position. And that ties into today's message. We put ourselves into position to receive from God. And when we do that, he'll take us on the ride of our lives. There's an infamous uh, Cardinals football game uh, just a couple seasons ago. Cardinals were on a historic start. I believe they were 9-2 and two or 10-2 and two or something like that, and they were playing the Packers on Thursday night football. And um, they were losing, and they had time to drive down the field, and uh, Kyler Murray, our young quarterback, was on the cusp of leading the team back to victory in a heroic fashion. And at, I think it was fourth and goal, right there by the end zone, Kyler Murray drops back to pass. He finds the one-on-one matchup he's looking for, a big, tall, uh, receiving A.J. Green in single coverage, and he lets it rip, a back shoulder pass, as they call it, so he can turn and grab it. The problem is A.J. Green wasn't expecting the pass, and so he didn't turn around. As a result, The ball flies right past him and into the hands of the defender, and it's intercepted for a touchback, sealing the victory for the Packers. And so because A.J. Green didn't turn around, he missed out on the reward of going down in history. Um, With the way fans are in Arizona, even though he had a short stint here, he would have lived together or or lived forever um, in our hearts But because he didn't position himself where the ball was going to be, he missed out. That's how it happens in general in football. See, if the if the receiver doesn't position himself where the ball's supposed to be, then it would be very foolish of him to blame the quarterback, right? It's just it's it's an argument I get get in with my son all the time. We'll be playing a catch, and the ball will hit him right in the hands, and he'll drop it and be like. Dad, what was that, right? And it's because he had to reach a little further. Maybe he had to run a little faster. And it's almost as if he has this expectation that the passes I throw him will come straight to him and then stop in midair so he can gently pluck them out of the sky. And anything short of that is my fault. And you know what? We do the same thing when it comes to God. We ask him for blessing But we're not running the plays that he's drawn up. Oftentimes when you're watching a football game and you'll see this pass, it looks like a really horrendous mistake by the quarterback. Like there was not even a receiver in the area. Why is he throwing to the wrong team? Nine times out of 10, it's because the receiver was supposed to go there and he didn't. He got mixed up. And he went somewhere he wasn't supposed to go. He was out of position. And sometimes, you know, we need to understand, we serve a God who desires to bless us. And he wants to bless our church. How many of you believe that? God doesn't just want this church to be a healthy church, but also a healthy and growing church. He wants to multiply us. He wants us to reach the lost. He wants to see great things happening here. But if we're not seeing his blessing and his growth in our life and in our church, should we assume that he's unwilling 
Would it be right to assume that um, there's something he's holding back or not doing? Or is it most likely because we find ourselves out of position? So to illustrate this, I need some help from a young person, somebody under 18 who wants to help me out. David, David Michael, come on up here. Let's give it up for David Michael. You have to say David Michael or everyone will think you're talking about David Sr. And uh, we had to fix that on Planning Center. So he's getting all these scheduled for things he's not a part of, right? So David, uh, hold that glass out for me. I want to illustrate you very, very simply the nature of God. He's got an empty cup. God's not empty, right? He has a lot to offer us. And this is what he does, right? Everybody say, ooh, ah. Groundbreaking visual, right? Now go ahead and pour that in just for the sake of not running out of space, okay? So he's going to pour that back in. So this is what God wants to do. There's a song I listened to, and I can't remember the name of it, but it, it, it sings this line. It's in your nature, you can't help it. What can stop all your goodness? He can't help it. It's in his nature. He pours out. That's what, he's, that's what he does. He's a God that blesses. He's a God that multiplies. And we see examples of it throughout Old and New Testament. And so it begs the question, what does God bless? Where does God bless? Who does God bless? But see, the reason why David was able, David Michael, was able to receive what God had or what this picture holds is because he was positioned to receive it. Now, what if David says, I'm not comfortable up on the platform? It makes me feel awkward because everyone's staring at me. So I want to go back over to my family by the table. Go ahead. Go back, back by your family. Just stand by him. Take the cup. Take the cup. Okay. But, but I'm here. And who holds the pitcher of water? Okay, and if this is where I'm pouring it out, is he going to benefit on the blessings of God? Don't worry, it's just water. Relax. (laughs) Or what if he says, you know what? I'm more comfortable over here by the speaker. Go ahead and come over to the speaker because I'm a teenager and I love really loud music and I want to go deaf, right? So I'm going to stand right next to, right? But this is what, this is the place And this is the time, this is the position in which I have determined that I'm going to pour out. Is he going to receive what I have for him? And you know, we do this in life as well. And so he might say these things, I'm more comfortable over here. And so what happens, he says, I want this, but I also want what God has for me. And so what happens is like, like grab a hold of that speaker there, right? Okay. Now I want you to, I want you to come near me, but bring the speaker with you. Go ahead. You can't move it. Okay. It doesn't work, right? What is he going to have to do to put himself in position to receive from me? And listen, church, we do this in life. We say things like, I want to take this job over here because it pays more money. But it may, might be taking us out of position to receive God's blessing in our life. I want to stay where I am because it's where I'm comfortable. But that may not be what God is blessing. I don't want to give that much. Because I might need it later. But God isn't going to bless your fear and your stinginess. God is going to bless your generosity. Or I only want to serve this much because I have a very busy schedule. But the important thing is not how busy your schedule is, but simply how much is God asking you to serve? Because that is what he's going to bless. Because ultimately it comes down to this. All excuses, even seemingly legitimate ones, fly out the window Because all it comes down to is being in position to receive what God desires to give us. God is ready to pour out, but when he does, will we be in position to receive? Let's give it up for David Michael. You can go ahead and just put that cup down there again. See, God has great plans for you. God has wonderful plans for this church, but we must move into position under the who, what, when, and where of the outpouring. See, it's not enough that we call upon the name of the Lord, right? What did Jesus say? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but there will come a day that Mike just alluded to where people say, wait, hold on a second. You just said, depart from me. 
I never knew you. But God, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? And what is his response? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Because our success in ministry even, and the way that we've been used by God, does not um, uh, counteract the disobedience that we have in our heart. The sin that we worship, that we put above God. And so we have to position ourselves to receive. And so not, God isn't just simply going to bless for the sake of blessing. And don't, under, don't misunderstand me. Uh, God, God in his grace oftentimes will, will provide for us because this is not a message about earning his favor, but it's about recognizing what he's willing to bless. Let me say that again. It's not about earning his favor, but it's about understanding what it is God is willing to bless. And so we, it's not just uh, what we need, but it's who God has called us to be. It is what God has called us to do. It is when he wants us to do it. It's where he wants us to go. There is a who, what, when, and where of the outpouring. And so if we are not submitted to those different areas in our life, then it's not God saying, I'm withholding my blessing. It's us saying, I'm stepping out from underneath your fountain, your provision, uh, your blessing in your favor, and I'm stepping outside of your will, and I'm going out on my own. And we find ourselves begging, God, please, my cup is empty. Fill my cup. But we're holding on to this world. We're holding on to our worries and fears. We're holding on to our doubts. We're holding on to the things that keep us bound, the things that keep us inactive. We're saying, God, where are you? My cup is empty. But what did David say? My cup runneth over. And then he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You're close beside me, even in the valleys. And so position matters. And so I want to challenge you this morning to move into position. We're going to take a few moments at our tables today to discuss this question. Are you living in a position to receive all that God has for you? And take the time to unwrap that and unpack that a little bit. How am I living in position to receive from God? How am I not living in position to receive from God? Let's discuss at our tables. Wow. Okay, so we had some fantastic conversation at our table. We got some young people over there that are offering a lot of really deep wisdom. Let's give it up for our young, our students, and our college students over here, and our youth leaders. Man, I don't know about you, but isn't it encouraging to see, and and this is, you you older folks know how much I love you, because I spend Thursdays with you every week, right? But isn't it great to see our congregation getting younger? Come on. We're reaching the next generation, and I believe that's what, a big part of what God has called us to do, and I love to see our older generation having opportunities to pour into our younger generation, amen? So much wisdom to offer. So we're challenging you this morning to move into position. I think half the battle is sometimes we don't take the moment to evaluate our lives and what position we're actually in. Typically, uh, who was it? Was it Marty earlier that was saying about how God kind of speaks to him when he's going through a tough time, right? Um, Sometimes we don't evaluate where we are until life smacks us upside the head. But what if we routinely did a check like David, where he says, search my heart, oh God. And this morning, my prayer is that we'll search our hearts so that we can be sure that we're standing in the position that God has called us to stand in. So if you turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 26, or you can follow along on your phone Bible app, or you can follow along on the screens, but Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 12. Here goes. A severe famine now struck the land as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, or Gerar, where Abimelech, Abimelech, that's a mouthful, king of the Philistines lived. 
The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants. Just as I solemnly promised Abraham your father, I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give them all of these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, she is my sister. He was afraid to say, she is my wife. He thought, they will kill me to get her because she is so beautiful. I was sharing this with the team this morning, and I said, I I can relate being married to such a babe myself. I'm always worried about my safety. Pray for her. She's still at home sick. But sometime later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Better not be his sister, right? Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, she's obviously your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get her from me, Isaac replied. How could you do this to us, Abimelech exclaimed. One of my people might easily have taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. Then Abimelech issued a public proclamation, anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. And when Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted, for the Lord blessed him. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask you to illuminate it and bring understanding to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to give you six positions to take so that you can receive the fullness of God's blessing and favor on your life. Six positions that we see emphasized here in this narrative. Now it starts off in verse one, letting us know that a severe famine struck the land as had happened before. It's important to point out. So Isaac moved to Gerar. The first position we need to take is a listening position. Why? Because this is a starting point for getting into the correct position. We need to have our ears tuned to the voice of God because Isaac did what we all do, didn't he? He reacted based on life experience. See, Isaac knew that his father, and I I didn't take the time to research whether he would have been born yet or not, but his father faced a similar situation. A severe famine struck the land. His father fled to Egypt, and sure enough, he did the same thing. He lied about his wife and said she was his sister. And so sometimes we we pass some things down through our examples to our children that we wish we didn't, right? And and that's kind of what happens here. And so Isaac did what we all do. Um, Something happens. He's like, well, I know what to do. How many of you are really quick to say, I know what to do, right? How many of you have reacted quickly, completely sure that you knew what you were doing until after you did it? And then you looked back and said, I wish I would have waited. I wish I would have prayed. I wish I would have asked somebody. I wish I would have paused 10 seconds to think before I put my foot in my mouth. And this is what Isaac did. He reacted based on life experience. And there's nothing wrong with life experience. How many of you know we can gain gain wisdom from life experience, right? But But the problem comes when our ears are closed to the gentle voice of God that comes through his Holy Spirit and we act, we react based on our own wisdom and life experience. And so it's easy to get caught up in this cycle, right? We can get trapped in this. It's the same cycle where the Israelites spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, circling around the mountain, right? Because um, God had, had, had revealed himself to them as a deliverer in powerful ways, but yet because there were generations of, um, of uh, 
being a slave, right? Generations of, of bondage, they were basing upon their past history uh, how to react to certain situations. They were definitely a glass half empty people at that time. And so they allowed their past to determine their future. And so the cycle is not that we're acting foolishly on the surface. In fact, oftentimes we react in ways that seem wise in the eyes of men. But the problem is God is speaking in the middle of it and we're not taking the time to listen. But here's the good news in this situation right here. Although Isaac immediately reacted before he made his way to Egypt, God stopped him in the land of Gerar and said, do not go to Egypt. And so Isaac heard God. The only way God can reposition you to where he wants you is if you first give him your ear. We often talk about how God speaks in a still small voice like Elijah uh, learned, uh, right? Not in the whirlwind, not in the earthquake, but a still small voice because we believe that God is a relational God and in order to hear a whisper, you've got to what? You've got to lean in. And anything he can use to bring us closer to him, he will absolutely use. But often when it comes to us, too many voices have our ear. Am I, am I preaching the truth this morning? There's too many voices out there. There's too many influences. We are plugged into something constantly. And those messages are mixed and convoluted and cloudy and contradicting. And even if we don't particularly follow one of those false messages, if all they do is occupy our ears, they've accomplished their purpose. If all they do is drown out the voice of God, they've accomplished the purpose of the enemy. But if we would take the time to position ourselves to hear, we'd save ourselves a whole lot of trouble. Have you ever been like me and you've been in a situation where you kind of felt something? It was a nudging, an urging, or a red flag, a warning, and you've shoved it down because everything looked great on the surface. Like this makes total sense. Come on, God. The timing is right. The need is there whatever it may be, and this seems like the life raft that you've thrown out to me, and yet if we're too quick to reach out and take hold of that life raft, we might learn that there's a hook on it. We might learn that we've just taken the bait, and so we have to take the time to hear. Now, skip ahead to verse five real quick. See, we know that God was making a promise to Isaac. He was extending the promise from Abraham and now extending it to Isaac. And it says in verse five, I will do this because, somebody say because. Okay, how many of you think that when the Bible says because, we should pay attention, right? Because the word because implies that the statement is um, the result of something else. Oftentimes it's because it's conditional, He says, I will do this because Abraham, what? Yeah, listened first, right? We'll get to the obey part. Abraham listened to me. See, what what he was transferring here is something the Bible calls a covenant. You can look back earlier on in Genesis about when he first made this covenant to Abraham, and it wasn't just like, I promise I'm going to do this, but this whole uh, ceremony took place. It was a blood covenant. There was sacrifice that took place. Um, It was very meaningful. And a covenant is something that can never be broken. But a covenant is a lot like a contract in that it is full of both promises and obligations. Promises and obligations, it means it binds both parties to a certain standard. Oftentimes, it's conditional. Uh, Throughout the word of God, we often see if-then promises, From God, if my people will humble themselves and pray, um, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. And and there's there's a responsibility that rests upon us. In other words, he's saying, I have all these promises for you, but the only way you can receive them is is if you put yourself in position of the covenant to receive. In verse two, he says, do as I tell you. He says, don't don't go to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Number two is an obedience position. An obedience position. So number one was a listening position. Number two is an obedience position. Isaac's plan was to do exactly as his father Abraham had done when there was a famine in the land. Go to the rich and fertile land of Egypt. 
because at least there will be well fed. Does that sound familiar? What did the Israelites say? They were slaves for 400 years. And they said, at least in Egypt, we had meat. At least in Egypt, we had water to drink. There are things that God has been wanting to give you. Things that I know deep within myself that God wants to do in this church. And the reason why we've missed out The reason why we haven't received it yet, listen, is because when it gets difficult, we're too quick to run to Egypt. When things get tough, we're too quick to give up. We're too quick to stop trusting. We're too quick to stop believing. I want to challenge you this morning. Don't mistake any opposition or any difficulty or any delay for God's absence. Or that he's going back on his word. Because it may be in the opposition. It may be in the difficulty. It may be in the delay that he's working things out. And if you step outside of the delay for the immediate gratification, what you do is you trade in the authentic for the substitute for the off-brand, for the generic, for the thing that doesn't last, the the imperishable for perishable things. When it becomes difficult and and you take the easy road, you end up at a different destination than what God intended for you to end up in. And when there's a delay, and so you take a shortcut to get there faster, you miss out on all the things God wanted to do in your life in the waiting. Quit running away when it gets hard. Quit, Quit coming up with the old excuse that says, I just feel like I need to take a step back right now. Right? I need, I need to, you know, I need to, I need to figure things out before I come back to church. That's the devil. I will tell you that right now. He's got you right where he wants you, out of position. Let me tell you one thing for sure I know. I don't know what circumstance you're facing. I don't know what season of life you're in right now. But if you're going to tell me right here today that you don't belong here on a Sunday morning, I'm telling you the devil has your ear and you have believed in a lie. Quit running when it gets hard because you're afraid that you're surrounded by people that are going to hold you accountable. The people that are going to speak the truth to you in love. Quit running because this is the only place you're going to find freedom and healing. God uses other people to bring that into your life. It's not that he doesn't have the ability to zap you and make you whole on his own, but in his beautiful design, he said, it is not good that man is alone. Let me create a a helper that is suitable for him. And that may be a big verse about marriage, but it also speaks to the need of human relationship that we have. You need to be here, not just once or twice a month, you need to be here regularly enough so that real relationships can be formed. Not only do you need to be here on Sunday mornings, but you need a life group. And if you haven't done Rooted, you better get your butt in a Rooted group this fall because it's going to change your life. God loves when it gets hard. Did you know that? God loves situations where it gets difficult and where you have to wait and where you have to lean on him because it pushes you into relationship. Nothing will drive you towards intimacy with God than difficult times, struggles, times of waiting. The the season in my life where I called it a season of limbo, which is such a lie. It's that feeling that you're just floating around aimlessly, just waiting for something to happen. Oh man, I remember I, sp- I wasted so many months of my life thinking I was in a season of limbo. And I even titled it that. I tell people, I just feel like I'm in limbo right now. And one day God just went, Bob, are you stupid? You think you're in limbo because your life isn't tied down right now. You think you're in limbo because you're not overwhelmed with responsibilities and so busy you don't even know what to do with yourself. You think you're in limbo because you're not plugged into full-time ministry. What are you doing with all this free time that I've given you? Because I've called you for this moment just as much as I've called you into the season where you stepped in as lead pastor of Fountain of Life. I called you into this season of rest. I called you in the season of pouring into yourself and feeding yourself and using your free time to share the gospel and be an evangelist and to to witness and to pray for those. Man, there is no such thing as limbo. 
if you find yourself positioned in his will. None of that's in my notes. This is going to be a long sermon, guys. You better pray for me. I, I'm going to say, I want to say what the, the old school Pentecostal pastors always say. The more you say amen and participate, the faster I'll preach, okay? That's, that's the deal today. All right. That's right. All right, so Abraham... Um, <laughs> God uses those times, doesn't he? Because it keeps us near. And, and going back down to verse five again, we're gonna keep jumping down to verse five because it really correlates. It says, Abraham obeyed my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. When I first read that, um, tell, me, tell me if you're with me and you just thought God was being redundant. Like, aren't these just synonyms? requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. Wouldn't it be quicker to just say he obeyed everything he was supposed to do? But there's not a wasted, empty word in the word of God, amen? So as I begin to look closer at these words individually and look at the original Hebrew, um, God just began to reveal things to me, some that come directly from the Hebrew meaning and some that just God's just speaking to our situations. And so the first word um, so, so first of all, let me say that when he says requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions, they're listed in this order for a purpose to show the level of commitment that Abraham had. Because here's the deal. Here's something that has led to a lot of suffering in the body of Christ. That modern Christianity has equated obedience with general compliance. Modern Christianity equates obedience to general compliance. In other words, yeah, I'm all about God. Like, God is a common theme in my life. Um, God is a, a name I profess. He's who I go to in my time of need, and I attend church semi-regularly, and, and, and that's a life committed to God. But in reality, you can't find an example of that anywhere in scriptures, that there's like this, the, the radicals for Jesus and then the casuals for Jesus. They're not separate categories. There's, there's either you're all in or you're all out. And we talked about it this morning in prayer. God gave me this image of, I don't have time to share this. Okay, I'm going to do it real fast. Of a hot tub. Okay of a hot tub. You got the people that sit on the edge and dangle their feet in the hot tub. And then you have the people that get all the way in. And it would be foolish of the people that are dangling their feet in there to complain that they're not receiving the full therapeutic benefits of the hot tub. And so, oh man, I'm so sore. I got this neck and shoulder pain and, and I'm sitting here next to the hot tub and nothing's changing. Well, get all the way in, stupid. Come on. The full benefits are when you completely submerge yourself in the perfect will of God. You've got to change position if you want to receive his healing and his blessing. Less of me and more of God is one of my biggest pet peeve statements. And it's not because it's not true. But it's because of what we, in the way we interpret it. I think sometimes we hear less of me and more of you in reality, what God wants to say to us is none of you, all of me. Uh, we, we take what John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. When in reality, I must die so that Christ can live within me, which is what Paul said. You got to understand in context, when, when John said he must increase and I must decrease, he was talking about his ministry because his disciples were upset. They're like, People aren't coming to us anymore to be baptized. Instead, they're going to Jesus and his disciples and they're baptizing him. And John says, that's perfect. I've accomplished exactly what I was supposed to do. My influence in the spotlight that was on me must be shifted to him. But we have taken that to mean that this is the life with God is just I give a little bit more of him. So, or more of myself to him so I can have a little bit more of him. And though I do believe in, you know, this progressive sanctification, you got to understand that so many times we slow down the work that God wants to do and what he could accomplish in moments in your life if you would bring yourself to complete surrender. We stretch out over years of wandering around the wilderness because we can't get it through our thick heads. We have taken a tragically casual approach to our obedience to Christ, and the church is suffering because of it. Okay, back to verse five. He says, he obeyed my requirements. That word requirements means charge 
or duties. And I want you to think of it as the things that we already know we should be doing. And it's, it speaks a lot to the people we are supposed to be or a lifestyle that is supposed to be lived. And so this isn't just one by one commands, but it's living out the heart of God, right? And being a represent, representation of God on the earth. These are the responsibilities that God gave Abraham. Responsibilities. Somebody say responsibilities. See, God blessed Abraham because of who he was as a man of God. That is the who of the who, what, when, and where of the blessing. God called him to be, not just to do. And in Genesis Genesis 17, 9, God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant, and you and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. So there's this lifestyle of living out a godly life. And so there's this continual responsibility that goes beyond the letter of the law and becomes a state of being in our heart. In other words, it was Abraham's responsibility to make sure that God remained on the throne of his heart unchallenged, which is why God spoke to him and asked him to do the unthinkable. And he says, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me on the altar because he he had to remain on the throne of his heart unrivaled. And because Abraham made that decision to obey, not only was his son spared, but he was blessed. He had faith and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He says he, obeyed, he, he um, obeyed my commands. Let's take a look at that word commands. These are specific instructions. Not general, but specific instructions for our particular circumstances. See, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, amen? And he gives us commands and directions on how we are to respond to specific situations in our life, right? Because how many of you know that this book, as, as, as full as it is, and I believe every answer is contained in here, it's not a manual. There's not like a glossary where like, okay, what do you do if your wife keeps yelling at you for squeezing the toothpaste from the middle and um, there's no peace in your home? Oh, that's right here, toothpaste. There it is in the word of God. It's not how the word of God works. And that's why the Holy Spirit shows us how the principles in scripture relate to our specific situation. And he gives us specific directions on how to respond to that. See, there was no law that commanded Isaac to stay where he was. It was the voice of God, a fresh word from God that commanded him to stay. How many times, church, have you used the absence of something specific in this book to give yourself license to do what you really want to do. Ignoring the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. I had a guy do that. He called me up one time and he's basically telling me that his marriage is falling apart. There's nothing left of it. It's not worth fighting for. And he came across this old girlfriend on Facebook and he's trying to get permission from me to pursue this relationship. If we hadn't been on the phone, I would have taken this book and slapped him upside his head. Like, what are, you, what are you not seeing in here about your specific situation that to, to know that that's not pleasing to God? But the word of God is not something that we thumb through looking for loopholes. But instead, we have to have our ears in tune to the commands of God that he gives for our specific situations in life. James 4, 17 reminds us that it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. That's ignoring the conviction, ignoring that still small voice and trying to justify it by taking something out of context or by saying, well, my specific situation isn't addressed in here exactly. He says he obeyed my decrees and instructions. This is where I want to talk about God's written word because now we're going to take the flip side of what I just said. Um, because here's the deal. There, you, though when God was speaking to Abraham and Isaac, there was not yet a written law. And so what this must refer to is what he had already decreed, what he had already spoken, and what was written on their hearts. Um, it's already been decreed. And so we act as if parts of the Bible are no longer relevant. And that's something our culture faces today, is it not? That we, we, we say, this book's really old, Okay, I mean, it's ancient. We're talking thousands of years old. And so obviously, it's not going to relate to culture today. So what we have to do 
is we have to look at culture today, look at what's acceptable, and then try to make this book fit into it so that it stays relevant. Because we don't want this book to become irrelevant, so we must adapt it so it stays relevant. Anybody see that happening in the world? That is a very dangerous place to go, and that's a direction this church will not take. Because the word of God was written not to be conformed to your life, but so that when you read it, you'll be conformed to the word of God. And that is the power that is in this book. That is why it says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Because what it does is it deals with the thoughts and intents of your heart. And it cuts deep to the point and it performs surgery on your heart and says, you need to change. You need to take what you believed is true and make it obedient to the truth of God's word. I hope you guys are liking this because I'm going slow. Um, (sighs) What has already been decreed, when your interpretation of God's word, when you reinterpret God's word to come into alignment with your culture, you're taking yourselves out of position. And this is a source of frustration, I think, for a lot of Christians today. They don't understand why they cannot hear from God or why God feels so far away. But here's the deal. God's word cannot accomplish what it intends in your heart until you apply it. We have a faith statement that we didn't say today, um, but almost every Sunday we say, this is my Bible, this is God's word. If I believe it and I what? Yeah, live it. Somebody said do it, but that's the same thing, right? If I live it, I will be calm everything it says that I am. That's why God gave us his word so that we can become who he has called us to be. All right. Somebody say, speed up, Pastor Joe. Verse three. It's not my fault. I start studying and the Holy Spirit stirs up all these passions within me. And he's like, put that down, put that down. So He wanted you to be here long today. Okay, okay, so verse three. Um, He says, don't go to Egypt. He says, live here. I will be with you. The promise is, I will be with you. Number three is a presence position. We must take up a presence position. See, the promise was preceded by a position, a location, a place that he wanted them to be. And the very place that God called Isaac to be was the land of the Philistines, a land of the enemy, a land of pagans, a land of immoral people. And he says, I want you to live as a foreigner here. And why would he be blessed? Because that land was blessed? Because those people were blessed? No, because I will be with you. You'll be blessed, not because of the land, but because I am with you. Let me tell you something, church. No matter where you are in life, famine or not, the best place for you to be is directly in the center of God's will. Directly at the feet of Jesus, directly in his presence. As I said before, the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. Sometimes the shadow of death is exactly where we want to be because Jesus is nearest. Um, The three men were not consumed in the furnace. Why? Because there was a fourth man in the fire. Sometimes the very place God has called you to be is in the fire. Sometimes the very place that God has called you to be is in the darkness and he promises to be as close to you as he needs to be in those moments. As we had David holding the cup earlier, many of us are missing out on God's blessing because we have so many good reasons why we're not positioned in his presence. My schedule won't allow it. My checkbook won't allow me to give. Um, My... um, It costs me too much. I'm too uncomfortable. I'm not confident enough to step in this role. Whatever it is, we use all these excuses. And listen, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I'll tell you what, God makes it clear in his word what he blesses. And until we step into that, we miss on the blessing. So many of us are missing out on God's blessing because we have so many good reasons, yet we remain confused and frustrated by God's supposed indifference to our circumstance. I don't understand, God, where are you? Why do you seem so far away? 
when in fact it's us that have removed ourselves from the fountain. Write this down in your notes if you're taking notes. If intimacy with God is not your priority, the blessing of God will remain a mystery. I'm going to say that again. If intimacy with God is not your priority, the blessing of God will remain a mystery. He says in verse 3, I will give them all these lands just as I promised your father. The fourth position is an ownership position. Here's what I mean, an ownership position. This was a transfer both of covenant and call. God was saying what I have promised Abraham, I promise unto you. What I have required of Abraham, I also have required of you. And so this could not be Abraham's faith anymore. It had to become Isaac's faith. And there comes a time in every Christian's life that you must take personal ownership of your faith and relationship with God. A lot of times it happens as young people, but sometimes we have Christians living in perpetual spiritual adolescence because we have failed to take hold and ownership of a relationship with God. And so for Isaac to enter into this covenant, he must receive it and trust in it personally. Kids and teenagers in the room this morning, your parents' faith cannot save you. There's a time in your life where God is going to hold you accountable and say it's time for you to step up and be the young man and young lady that you have been called to be. You cannot depend on your parents' faith to save you. Don't wait until you're 20 years old and going to college and listening to a professor tell you that we're all here on accident, but get your life right with him now. Step into your relationship with him now. Invest in him now. Be in his presence. Be in his word. Be in his in prayer now because that's the only way you're going to survive. It's the only way you're going to receive what God has for you. Adults, your pastor's faith cannot save you. It doesn't matter how good he preaches or how long he preaches or how short he preaches or how soon he gets you out to lunch. Your pastor's faith cannot save you. You cannot live off of someone else's devotional life. You cannot ride the coattails off your favorite preacher on YouTube. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus through someone else's prayer life. You cannot live on mission by giving alone. Sometimes you have to step in to your purpose. Verse four says, through your descendants, all the nations will be blessed. And our fifth position is this. I'm gonna try to wrap up by noon. You guys will still love me, right? Somebody say, we're used to it. (laughs) Number five, a serving position. A serving position. Do you see the connection I'm making there? Through your descendants, all the nations will be blessed. It is always God's desire to use you to be a blessing to someone else. Mark 9.35b, Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. This is the heart of Jesus Christ. This is what he came to do, not just because we needed it, but because we needed to see the example to follow. He says, as you've seen me do, you will be blessed for doing it also. Who believes that this morning? God values service so highly that he promises to elevate all those who have the heart of a servant. He says, he who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. He's looking for someone who says, I want to serve, not because I feel obligated to serve, but because I desire to serve, because I understand the joy in serving, because I understand the heart of God in serving. And he says, you, that one right there who was willing to hold a toilet brush before they were given a microphone, I will exalt you. I will lift you up because you understand my heart. And so in verse six, we learn that Isaac ultimately obeyed and it says Isaac stayed. He stayed there. He'd plant his crops. But Isaac did something that we often do. He kind of got lost for a moment. He had a, a lapse in judgment. He forgot, I think, who he was. He forgot maybe who God was. And he stayed because he trusted God which is the kind of obedience that God commands all of us to have, right? Not because of personal gain, not just because we hope we're gonna get blessed, but because we trust him. We trust that he has our best intentions. Um, Because listen, it all went wrong in the garden when Eve and Adam stopped trusting God, right? The the whole, the question that the enemy proposed was, was, does God really have what's best for you in mind? Or is is he holding you down because he wants to keep you below him? He doesn't want you to be like him. And when that doubt crept in, that's where everything went wrong. 
But in reality, God's laws, and this is important. I think you should write this down too. God's laws are not for his benefit, but for yours. God's laws were never intended to just please him, although he is pleased by it, but they're for your benefit. They're for your abundant life. Where in your life this morning are you not aligned with his will? Where have you stepped out from underneath this fountain, dry and empty, and not understanding why? Verse seven, that's when we learn. He steps outside of God's will for a moment there, I believe. It says, when the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, he said, she is my sister because he was afraid, right? Number six, we cannot forget this one. Sometimes one of the more important ones is the last one. Number six is a holy position, a holy position. See, see Isaac forgot that he was set apart. Isaac forgot that he was a part of a chosen generation. Isaac forgot that he was a representation of the heavenly father, of the holy God. And it, when he stepped outside of that, man, that changes things. It's safe to say, right, that this is not the way a man of God should behave, right? He's basically throwing his wife to the wolves to save his own life. I mean, let's, let's be honest about this. For him to ask her to say that she was his sister is basically him saying, let them do whatever they want with you. Dang. I can't believe she came back to him after that, right? I'll tell you right now, my wife would be gone. <laughs> right, that is just messed up. Like, like, just let them do whatever they want with you because I, I wanna live. But, but did he think that through? What would have happened if someone took her as his wife? Then she's gone. He's just trading away this relationship. Wow, big mistake. And when we take ourselves out of a holy position and we forget we've been set apart and called to live godly lives, we move ourselves into position for something else. We bring ourselves into the enemy's territory. And how many of you know that in Satan's kingdom, he's got basically the opposite of everything God has, right? Everything's a counterfeit. Everything is flipped upside down and twisted. And so if God has a cup and a pitcher of blessing, you better understand that Satan has a cup and a pitcher of torment because the wages of sin is death. And if you drink of that cup, then don't be surprised when you get sick. That's how sin works. And when we step into sin, we get sick and it wreaks all sorts of havoc, not just in our life, but who else stood to suffer the consequences of that decision? His wife, his kids, his family and the, not to mention the example he was setting for his people. But we read that the king saw how Isaac was showing affection to Rebekah, and so he calls him out on the carpet. He says in verse 9, she's obviously your wife. So why did you say she's my sister? How could you do this? In verse 10, one of my people might have taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. Can we just pause there and, and, and think about this? What a sad state when our testimony is so tarnished that we are rebuked by the pagan. We're rebuked by unbelievers because what we're doing is so obviously wrong that them and their carnal thinking can see the twistedness of our decisions without fearing the one true God can call us out and show us our hypocrisy. What a sad state. When in reality, it's Peter that tells us to live such good lives that the unbeliever will glorify God. Such good lives. How many of you think it's important to live holy? To keep yourself in that position of holiness because so much depends upon it. But here's the good news. Skip down to verse 12. It says, Isaac harvested a hundred times more than he planted because the Lord blessed him. So we're seeing here this beautiful balance of coming into alignment with God's will and being blessed because of it, but recovering from stumbling and making a mistake and, and stepping back into his will. That's the heart of our God. He ultimately, no matter how, how many times we fall down or how bumpy the road is, the point is he, he gets us back 
on track because where he wants to place us is underneath the fountain. And God may be at work in your life today and it may be in the difficulties, it may be in the struggle, it may be in the inner turmoil that you're facing today. And he's saying, like we learned about Jacob wrestling with God, stop wrestling with me and instead hold on to me. Do you remember that in the story? That was the shift. It says he wrestled with him until daybreak. Guess what? He made no progress. But the blessing came when he refused to let go. It wasn't when he overcame God. He didn't pin him. He just refused to let go. Right now, wherever you are in your life, refuse to let go. Change your position. If your circumstances have caused you to turn away and run, quit being stupid. Wake up. There's only one way to go. You can either run and be on your own and be angry and frustrated and mad, or you can come back to the feet of Jesus and cling to him and allow him to perform the healing that only he can, he can perform in your life. Because Isaac had the vision to use what he had, even in the middle of a famine and plant it, he saw God do the miraculous. Church, we've got to stop making excuses for why we aren't using what God has given us. It's just not the right season. I just got to figure things out first. Uh, Don't make enough money yet. If I get this promotion, then I'll give God my time. Or we can choose to trust in God and in his character that he will reward us for our immediate obedience. I heard a preacher say, delayed obedience is disobedience. I think that is true when it comes to our relationship with God too. It's It's good that we finally obey, right? Don't get me wrong. But delayed obedience in that moment is disobedience. No seed that you sow in faith, even if you feel like it's your scraps, it's your leftovers, and it's your fumes. God might be needing to do a work in your life where you rebalance things, sure, you like clear your calendars. Um, but maybe it's even to make a sacrifice and say, I'm going to make less money so that I can step into my calling. That's between you and God. But if you don't use what you have, <laughs> you're gonna miss out on the multiplied blessing of God because that's his heart. He wants to take your faithfulness and he wants to multiply it for you and for everyone around you that throughout your lifetime and for the generations that follow you, people will be blessed through you and through your descendants. That's the legacy of the church today. You're living in Abraham's blessing. You're here because he believed, because he listened, because he obeyed. We are all children of Abraham because we were grafted in through the death of Jesus on the cross. Somebody just needs to give praise to God for that. Come on, come on. So here's what I wanna do. I just wanna invite you to stand for a moment this morning. And uh, the team is gonna lead us in this song again. And I think it's appropriate when we're talking about changing our position to ask you to physically change your position. So can we, as a way to respond to this challenge today, to say, God, I recognize you've shown me through the conviction of your Holy Spirit, the areas of my life that are not submitted to you or I'm out of position. And as a physical response, I'm gonna change my physical position. And I just want you to find a place that's just not where you are right now. It doesn't have to be at the front but it can't be where you are right now, okay? We're just, we're gonna do this together. You know, I'm not being legalistic. We're just gonna do this together. I want you to find a place to be alone. And as we sing this song, I want you to consider those words for yourself to be like Isaac and to make it personal to you, take ownership of this commitment. And I want you to say, God, I'm changing my position. In spite of the difficulties, in spite of what I'm suffering right now, I come back to the feet of Jesus Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in my life. Amen. Can we do that? Praise God. Let's sing. I just want to bless your name. I 
Oh, Lord. God, let that revelation bring freedom to every mind that is in bondage, every heart that is in bondage today, Lord God, to know who they are as a child of God, to step into the freedom that you paid such a dear price for on the cross, Lord. And I thank you, God, for setting us free today from depression, for setting us free um, from anxiety and fear and doubt. Thank you for setting us free from the idols in our life and the things that we've exalted above you, the things that we've given priority to that have no business sitting on your throne. We repent of those things. We thank you, God, that we're stepping into freedom now. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. I believe that uh, God gave me a quick word I just want to share before I dismiss you is that some of you, the way that you're going to change your position is you're going to change your routine. You're going to change your routine. There's something about your routine he wants you to change. There's patterns in your life that have to be broken. As they say, nothing changes until something changes. And God's going to give you something very specific, right? Maybe he's already put it on your mind and upon your heart right now. Something that needs to stop, something that needs to cease, or something that needs to change. Maybe you're going to get up earlier um, and, and you're going to start a prayer and Bible routine. Um, maybe you're going to change your routine of your prayer and Bible somehow. But there's something that he wants to break. There's a pattern he wants to break. There's a practice he wants to break. And there's, there's a, a routine that needs to be changed. And so if that's for you today, I pray you receive that. Is God good? Hey, I, I hope you guys had as good of a time as I did today. Um, but God is good. God is faithful. Go and walk in his will for your life move into position because he's got great plans for us as a church. Amen. All right. Have a wonderful day today. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a blessed day.